alpacas are the future. This is spoilers. Fuck would you buy alpacas? Alpacas really in the cage. Come on. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Spoilers. This is your host, Stevie. As with me, with me as always when we do these episodes, Pappy. That's me, your co-host. Uh, I'm not driving the ship tonight because it's another. Hey, Steve, or hey, Pappy, you got to watch this movie. <laughs> text from Stevie. <He's> like, okay. <laughs> Aren't you happy you did it though? I am really happy. The movie's Color Out of Space, not the Color Out of Space, which I saw as a different movie from 2014. This is the 2019 movie with Nick Cage and the same producing team as Mandy, which I think you mentioned to me, and like the same color guy. Yeah, it's um, I saw the same producers out of Mandy, which we did. Elijah Wood is one of them. <laughs> Elijah Wood, really? Yeah, Elijah Wood was a producer on Mandy and on this, which is kind of crazy. Really? I and mean, then a couple other people who I don't know who they are. Didn't know Frodo had it in him. But uh, yeah, I uh, saw a trailer for this last year and was planning on seeing it this year. And then the world stopped. So it didn't. Did it come out in the United States at all theatrically? I I'm not sure. I, I know. I think I saw on box office it made a million dollars. Let's see. So that's like basically no. Uh, it um, it debuted at Telluride in September 7, 2019, and then January 24th is when it was released nationwide, which I imagine it was probably I don't know 20 theaters, 26 theaters. Uh, this says it was on 81 theaters when it went the widest, making $2,000 a theater, <sighs> which is not, not great. Uh, got out done by bad boys for life at the time. <laughs> Doolittle, the gentleman. That's a, that's a tough thing to go up against. It was a different time, um, in theaters, but that I do regret not seeing this on the big screen. I, we did actually upgrade our television during this quarantine. Uh, it was just time. Uh, and it's been really nice to have. And so it looked pretty good. But, man, I really wish I could have gotten, like, an in-theater surround sound ex- or surrounding experience uh, for this like I, got, like I got with Mandy. Would you like better, the visuals in this or the visuals in Mandy? Ooh. Um, I prefer the visuals in this. They seem kind of more, like, very poppy. Mm-hmm. My eyes are just naturally attracted to colors like that. Like the bright purples, the bright pinks, kind of like a neon 80s type thing. Uh, but I prefer the premise of Mandy. I could see that. Yeah, that's where I lie in between there. But speaking of theaters, Pat, have you watched it yet? Have I watched it yet? Have you watched Heat on your brand new TV yet? I've been no, telling you. I haven't yet. Just I do will. it. Just do it. That's a crazy thing. I don't even know what spoilers episode that is, but it's like one of the one spoilers episodes I wasn't on. I was traveling to work <laughs> at the time. And so I've seen Heat. I watched it in an airplane, which doesn't really count as even seeing a movie. So I owe it, it another doesn't. rewatch. And my my fiance hasn't seen it, so I'm I'm hoping she'll be down to watch it <sighs> maybe this weekend. Please just watch it. I've been on a real. It's a long movie though. It's a commitment. It, it, it's a commitment. It's three hours out of your day. But I've been on a real bank robbery movie kick lately. But getting back to the movie at hand, um. This movie is all sorts of bonkers and plays super fast and loose with the rules. <laughs> uh, I think this is based off an H.P. Lovecraft story. Pap, do you have any frame of reference? Have you ever read any H.P. Lovecraft? I read a couple stories, like the Cthulhu one. Um, it's actually, it ties into a, a story I've told on this podcast before on the, the Chambers of Shaolin episode that I was drinking in a bar one time and reading a book the book I was reading was like the collections of H.P. Lovecraft and some like crazy guy, like legitimately crazy guy came up to me and started talking about all these crazy conspiracy <laughs> theories and stuff and handed me a, a, like a, a Kung Fu DVD and left. And so, and so like that, I've talked about that before in this podcast. So I always think about that when I think Lovecraft, but it's, it's a very modernized version though, right? It's very contemporary. I, I'm sure he wasn't writing about a hydrologist. Or Nick Cage doing up talk. That is so weird. We got to talk about that. What, do you have any uh, Lovecraft reference? I've never... I mean, well, what's his collection of stories called? It's like the Necronomicon, I think it's what it's called. Is that right? Uh, I don't know about that. Like, yeah, he's just a creepy story 
writer, like sci-fi. Well, like, I know about Cthulhu, obviously, and stuff like that, but I've never read any H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, the closest thing I have is um, I read a Stephen King novel called Revival, and uh, watching it, reading an interview with Stephen King after that, apparently he took a ton from H.P. Lovecraft and put it into his own story, so... That's about as far as I get with H.P. Lovecraft. I think he's like one of those like notorious. Like, he might be like anti-Semitic. I hope his estate doesn't sue me. He is long dead, but like, I think he's like <laughs> a notorious like not good guy for something like that. Like, he has some like fucked up like racist or pol- or like bad political. Did he have some views that like would get him canceled if he were still alive today? I there's uh, there must be a statute of limitations on it because this is like <laughs> proud of like the H.P. Lovecraft tie-in. Like so maybe like in a hundred years people would be like by J.K. Rowling, The Return of Harry Potter or something, and like it'll all fade. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's watching this you wouldn't. It, I didn't get classical lit vibes from this. Did you? Like maybe in the sense that it's like the color is enhancing what's worse about each of the characters you know what i mean but it doesn't feel like a frankenstein adaptation or or anything like that it feels like a very modern poppy movie i mean yeah like if you hadn't like if i mean if someone hadn't told me or hadn't read that this was directly from hp lovecraft or watch it in the trailer where it says from hp lovecraft i would have had no clue that this came from somebody in like the early 1900s you know this is very contemporary outside for the beginning though which I don't know. This just seemed very odd to me, but I guess you have to start somewhere. I hate uh, the beginning. With the daughter I, starting, I mean, with the daughter well, doing like the pentagram ritual. I hundred, I hundred percent don't want to go this scene by scene. But there's this whole like framing of it where it's the hydrologist is doing a narration. You remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah. And he talks about like how there's been stories in the ancient town called Arkham, which which I immediately think Batman. When I hear that, Arkham Asylum, dude. Is there? Is it's not from anything else, right? Like that's Arkham is. I think Arkham is Batman. Yeah, the town is Arkham, and he says something like that: the, the woods are ancient and haunted, which is fine and is creepy, but it's like the threat is from outer space. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a new threat that is invading. That just like came yeah. In. It's a weird like way to set up and frame the movie that's actually like more of a sci fi. Yeah, story. like that narration like belongs like in The Witch. Yeah. Which would have made sense. And there was a narration in The Witch, which mm-hmm. was extremely haunting. This is I mean, you really could have done without it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the hydrologist's name is Ward in the movie, played by Ward Phillips. Played by Elliot Knight. Uh I don't know him from anything else he's been in a a bunch of tv shows it looks Mm -hmm. like it's a weird he's our main character right like would you say so is he our protagonist um well that's what's i think so much fun about this movie which i've talked to you about this before is you and i watch a lot of movies like i mean you and i almost watch a movie every day and we get to a point where (laughs) Almost like your contemporary, like, hero ensemble stories or just, you know, a natural story, person with a problem stories, uh, become kind of boring. And this movie doesn't really have a protagonist or an antagonist. It's really strange, isn't it? Like, the traditional way and beats that you would do this story is, like, like the, the movie actually starts off with Ward Phillips shows up. Meets the daughter doing the satanic ritual. For her mother with cancer. For her mother with cancer. And in a traditional movie, he would, like, hang with the family for the duration of the story, right? Like, that would be, like, kind of, like, us as the audience, like, entering the story with this character. He dips out for a significant portion of an this hour. two-hour movie. I would, Yeah, I would want to say, like, an hour of the heart of the movie. Totally gone. <laughs> and then, this is spoilers, at the end... He's the guy who's like our 30 years later, here's like a look back at like this, like what happened. You know what I mean? Like he's the one giving us that perspective in like the future, which is just so, so weird. It's very all over the place in that sense. Yeah. I mean, another way to do it too is, I mean, Nick Cage is obviously a struggling farmer who, you know, a wife, he has a wife he loves very much, uh, mm-hmm. is going through breast cancer, just went through her mastectomy, I think is what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, another way to do it is, you know, 
he's trying to battle through this, keep his kids in line, and then this happens on top of it. And this is a man, you know, you can tell a story of really struggling to keep his sanity with everything going on in life. Like, that's another way to tell this story. And this movie, for whatever reason, I, maybe it's because I don't watch a lot of movies like this very often, was just so fast and loose with the rules because there were no rules. It was literally just purple rock comes in from space and then things start to happen. Like, it's like all of reality becomes suspect from... There's, there's no, like, clear manifestation of this threat, right? And that's kind of something I was talking about with my fiance. It's like, what is what is this thing's powers? And, like, we're just ultimately kind of left with it just kind of fucks with everything around it, right? Like, it either zaps you or it kind of, like, through osmosis, like, brings out the worst traits in you. Like I said, like, the, the daughter, Lavinia, she has, like, some self-harm mm -hmm. stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it shows the beginning and then, like, she ends up like, cutting herself. And, and that doesn't really necessarily work for all the characters as well, but, yeah, it could zap you. It becomes, like, a bug at some point. Like, he finds that, like, what looks like a like a like a breast implant type thing right that ends up growing legs in the shower yeah Remember that thing like yeah, yeah like none of it like really fits together it's just all crazy and like you've alluded to it before like what is going on with nick cage's accents in this movie okay yeah this is this is something because i mean this is a man i imagine was living a much different life before he came back to his father's farm right mm -hmm. this is somebody who doesn't seem very sure-footed in in the farming industry well, it goes from, yeah, that scene where we're introduced to the, the two, like, younger characters, the the satanic ritual. We get to meet the family. And, like, I get the sense that he's kind of a loser. Like, I get a lot That's of, That's what like, I was getting. Jerry Beth vibes. <laughs> you know what I mean? From their relationship. <laughs> Jerry Beth Smith. But, yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, yeah, because, I mean, his wife is, I mean, she's a day trader, right? She seems to be a date, not, not only a day trader, she seems to be like putting together like stock packages for yeah. really wealthy clients, like managing their money, which this movie is like a really perfect quarantine movie as well, because she has all these like frustrations from working from home, like her it's internet really sucks. It's really good. It's, it's perfectly timed. And her Jerry Nathan, Nicholas Cage husband is like super annoying. Dinner's ready. It's getting cold. While she's trying to like close these like, you know, six figure deals. <laughs> 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 He's like worried about his alpaca milk. It's just, it, it worked really well, I think, for the time. Uh, seeing it now, yeah, it's it's it, you know it's. I appreciate you bring up kind of loser vibes because, like you know, like you said, she's closing these huge deals, and you know what is Nick Cage really doing? And what I thought was kind of cherry on the cake was. You know, he probably doesn't feel like he's pulling his weight in the relationship whatsoever. He probably mm. feels terrible about it. And then you get to the dinner table, and his kids hate his food. Like, mm. <laughs> it was just, I, I, don't know, I thought it was kind of a cool way to tell that story. But, um, yeah, the way this movie really works is when that rock lands, things start moving really quickly, and things start to get really gruesome. Um, what I thought balanced it was the colors in this movie with the bright purples, the violets, the pinks, you know, just the way things, I mean, the way even the colors bounce off the characters' faces were just so neat to me. I'm um, on the gruesome aspect of it, um, gruesome side of it, you know, what to you was kind of like stood out to you, like is kind of like, wow, this movie is really cool and intense at the same time. Because there were some scenes that were just horrifying. Uh, I mean, probably the fusion. Oh, uh, dude. The mom, uh, which I don't know if I know the mom from anything else. Nip Tuck. Nip Tuck. Nip -tuck. I haven't seen Nip Tuck, but the kid is from Haunting of Hill House, which is weird because he's playing basically the same character again, where he's got like an imaginary friend that he's hearing. Quick sidebar. You, did you like Haunting of Hill House? We talked about it a little bit off mic, <sighs> but I liked it until the end. I didn't like the ending of that show. It had the me The second hooked. to last episode's like a masterpiece, though. The one that's you, like you could have ended it right there, Birdman style. Yeah, uh, 1917. Uh, but so yeah, the kids playing the same character, and they, yeah, they, they get zapped by the lightning. And like that's like I said, like I don't know if all of the setups are balanced quite as well right this is a two hour movie it's trying to set up like these characters flaws and like the the, the rock is i guess like, supposed to bring out the worst in them 
I guess there's a sense of codependence between the son and the mom, and then that's kind of into that she tries to like reabsorb him, but it's mm-hmm. it's really gruesome. They become like fused together. The makeup looks really great. It seemed to be fairly fairly practical. I I thought in terms of like the way that it looked, it was it was really gross and, and cool. Well, the smart thing this movie did too was, you know, when the fusion happens, they don't show it. All they yeah. show is the reaction of, you know, the oldest son in Nick Cage, just kind of like, oh, you know what I mean? It's just kind of this look of horror that mm-hmm. I think was scarier than immediately showing the fusion. But what that scene reminded me of a lot was Annihilation and the Bear. A hundred percent. I got huge Annihilation vibes from this movie. I felt like even some of the visual effects felt very similar to those that were like used in, in Annihilation, like especially at the end of Annihilation, I, I think sometimes I saw a lot of that in this movie, didn't you? Yeah, um, I mean, just and I haven't felt like that queasy in a movie since Annihilation with the bear. The bear, yeah. That, I mean, that movie made me gag just from hearing that bear scream. It was horrible, and this movie had the same reaction when they, you know, finally drag the mom and dad upstairs, or the the mother and the son upstairs. And you get to see for the first time they are legitimately fused. It's really scary. Okay, but you mentioned the older son as well. I was talking uh, with my fiance earlier, kind of like recapping, getting ready for this podcast. And I was like, you know how in video games you can like give certain character points, like specific characters? (laughs) It's like they gave all of the character points to the daughter and like her character's just like maxed out in terms of character like she's she's, like she's this, 100 across the board she's a wiccan but she's also very caring and she's also like the one who's like the emotional core of the movie in a lot of ways she's like the main character yeah. and then her big brother benny is nothing he got like zero points he's got like a stoner and he likes to look at space on his <laughs> computer which isn't even like a thing like he's literally just like looking at pictures of space or some kind of like weird like cheap software or something like like can you tell me anything about benny as a character in this movie or like why what he adds um man the only thing that i can think of is i've told you this before and i think it kind of relates to this movie is a lot of times in films uh, a male character's greatest fear is turning into their father okay that was definitely Nick Cage's arc, because you can tell he wasn't happy being back at the farm. He definitely had some leftover angst. Kicking, he's a kick the dog guy. Yeah, um, and I was hoping they were gonna go there with the son, and they never did. There's a whole sentence where he's like, "Has weird shit been happening to you?" I was just in the woods and couldn't see where I was going and got lost. And it sounds like a scene that was a hundred percent cut from this movie. You know what I mean? Like it sounds like that was something that happened. Yeah. And it didn't work for whatever reason. It's very strange to me, his inclusion. Yeah. It just, it did work. But the thing that this movie did good was kind of the, um, the separation of party. You know what I mean? Like, some movies can do the Scooby Doo thing, yeah, where you know they can all be together and say, you know, you go this way, you go this way, but we'll cover more ground that way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's like the cheap way of doing things. I think the breaking up of the party in this movie was much more organic, at least. Like mm-hmm. it felt like each character was on their own journey organically, not just you go this way, I go right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it felt like when those moments happen, when they separate, this movie does a great job of disorienting you as the audience. Like I'm I'm sure in the Lovecraft short story, there's a lot of like details that are going to be hard to convey on the screen. Like Nick Cage even says, it's a color like I've never seen before. Like how the fuck are you supposed to show that? that? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So it's like showing things like, in one scene it will be day and then the next scene it will be night but in like the context of the movie only like 10 minutes has passed yeah. you know what I mean like that kind of shit just like it doesn't even like throw you off in a major way but as you're kind of it makes you feel uneasy you know what I mean it's just enough like static and confusion for you to like really get into it and so it makes those like character split ups like all the more like disorienting it's like how, how long have they been apart like when's the last time they saw each other like when when were these conversations even happening? You know what I mean? It's really crazy like that. And speaking of 
Tommy Chong's just hanging out there what in is, the backyard. What? <laughs> we haven't talked about him at all. <laughs> like just letting time go by. <laughs> with him. Hey man, uh, yeah, hey man. Tommy Chong's just uh, chilling out in his little. Uh, he's a squatter, right? Nick Cage calls him a squatter. Like the only really bridge that we have to him is Ward. Like. Without Ward going to talk to him multiple times in the movie, there'd be no reason for us as the audience to see what's even going on back there. The family has, like, zero interest in him. Like, he's just kind of there. I was hoping that his character would be closer in proximity to the house, and he would have been, like, more involved with the family, if that makes sense. He's awesome in this movie. He's, he's perfect. awesome in this movie. His scenes are cool, especially when uh, that kind of terrifying deity is like talking through Tommy Chong, like on the recorder. Mm-hmm. Like those scenes were really cool, and I felt like <laughs> it was just one of those things where, like, hey, this character's out there, and we need a reason to talk to him. I don't know. It just didn't feel like that character was as connected with the rest of the characters. You know what I mean? Well, it's like, you know, Nick Cage and Tommy Chong were clearly never on set at the same time. You know what I mean? It's like they got yeah. who they could. And was, I'm not trying to, like... I, I'm just trying to, like, set that up as an audience in case you haven't seen this as expectations. You look at the cast, you're like, oh, this is amazing. It's it, Well... Well, it is and it isn't. It is and it isn't, yeah. It's not like like all of these people are together at the same time. Now I understand it. Like, it's not a big, big deal. It, it is a long movie but this movie has a lot of moments of comedy i think tommy chong provides a couple of them right like even just like from the fact that you see him it's kind of hilarious when he just shows up in a movie but yeah nick cage's, nick cage's accent i don't think we hit, we hit on that uh, i think i brought it up but like his accent a couple times cracked me the fuck up too like so it's, it's definitely got some comedic elements as well wouldn't you say pat for our viewers who are listening right now that don't know what is up talk uh, and where is like, it predominantly found? It's like the West Coast, right? Like, I can't even do it. It's can almost you... like... It's, it, yeah. How could I do it? Like, it would be me saying, like, I know you haven't seen this film, but what we're going to do right now, yeah. it's it, it's the kind of, like, really throwing up, like, the last ends of a sentence. Like, picture, like, a valley girl. Like, I used mm-hmm. to know this girl. Like, actually, I still do know her. Um, went to college with her where she was from Fort Wayne, Indiana and for some odd reason would talk with up talk and it would drive me up the wall. Uh, <laughs> well, so, so yeah, his, his accent degrades as the craziness <laughs> it's like so happens weird. and like, it, it's very even subtle at first. It's like, even like the way like, he's first talking about the alpacas is very early on and it sounds like a little <laughs> weird. It's, and, yeah, it's off. So this is like, I've watched a lot of Nick Cage recently, Stevie. I don't even know if we've talked about this off mic, but like I, I watched like Raising Arizona, Mandy, The Rock, and now this. Like within like just since quarantine happened, so like in the past like six you're months a good or Nick so. Cage kick, dude. I fucking love Nick Cage, but like this this version of Nick Cage, like there's a sense that I get like the end of Mandy where you have Nick Cage's like crazy smile. Like now you need the shot of Nick Cage being kind of crazy for the trailer, right? Like, when you see Nick Cage, he's selling... He's a good actor, and don't get me wrong, but he's also... Oscar winner. Oscar winner. Oscar winner Nick Cage, great actor, but he's also selling a sense of chaos, I feel like, right? Like, like you're seeing a Nick Cage movie, you're expecting him to be a little bit wild, and I feel like that's where the accent comes in, right? You're just being like, okay, Nick Cage, be crazy, and that's kind of what what he's giving you there. It's, It's like replacing him yelling. The accent. Holy shit. They should have been put back in the barn hours ago. We haven't even fed them yet, have you? Dad, I tried, but... What do you mean, you tried? Do you have any idea how much those animals cost us? They are alpacas. Alpacas. I mean, let's be honest, Pap. Like, Nick Cage kind of sold us on this movie, right? 100%. We're not seeing this with the, if the Nick Cage is in it, right? Like, even with Elijah Wood producing. Even with Elijah Wood producing, let's just throw an actor in here. Let's just, let's just for fun's sake. Um, pa, 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 pa. Throw out an actor. Throw, throw an act- What's that? Living? Like, like actual- yeah, throw out a living actor that you could replace with Nick Cage in this movie. Uh, I, I'm having 
Sean like Bean. Me- Sean Bean. Are we seeing this movie with Sean Bean in it? That would be such a different movie. Like, I can't even... What was the movie that we saw? It Comes at Night? Who it Comes Ter- at Night. That was... Ter- um... Edrington? What's his oh, name? Oh, uh, Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton? Put him in there. Would we see this movie? I'm, I, I'm a big fan of Joel Edgerton. I would say this. If this movie had the A24 label, that's a different draw. But this is like a distinctly different thing from an A24 movie, I feel like. It's not trying to be an A24 movie. It's trying to be a kind of crazy... It's definitely going for the art house, like good, like really well done cinematography like oh yeah classical story adaptation yeah and it's really neat too i mean like you said earlier i wish i saw this in theaters because like when nick cage steps out that one morning after the meteor and the whole all the woods and the ground everything is purple and pink and violet so cool i mean it that shot alone, like in the trailer, sold me on seeing this movie. Like visually, mm. it's stunning. And one thing I appreciate about appreciate about this movie too is you get to like stay in the visuals the entire time, really, because there are no rules in this story. Like you get to stay in that land for a long time mm. and never be sucked out. With I mean, you know what I mean. There's no rules, but I'll, I, I would like also if you haven't seen this, it's not avant garde to the point where it's like super disorienting. You know what I mean? No, like they do yeah. a good job of like we talked about this on the collector. We had no fucking idea like how the rooms <laughs> in that house like related to each other in the in the slightest <laughs> bit. Like it didn't even make any sense. It made no sense. This movie has a couple. I would even say like iconic shots where it's like you have the living room the hallway and the kitchen has like three different colors of rooms. And like mm-hmm. a lot of things happen. Like that's where the mom cuts her finger off or kind of two like fingers relating things there. And then the wine cellar, which is set up earlier in the movie ends up being like kind of a bomb shelter for him. Yeah. So like the movie, the movie does fall on itself really well, but it's not restricted in where it goes. Correct. It doesn't uh, put itself in a corner mm-hmm. where it becomes like cagey. And you're like, well, why didn't they just do that? It's just like you said, fast and loose. Which I loved. I mean, yeah. I mean, doesn't everybody love that? But uh, I also got some Thing vibes, too, with the alpacas in the barn. 100%. Yeah. I think that was... Uh, I don't know if that was... I don't know if the Thing comes from H.P. Lovecraft or... Well, even know, just in the nature of the villain, right? That it falls from outer space. It's a very right. Thing premise. Yeah. It's a very, very similar premise. And, I mean, I kind of went... It, was this a short story? The color out of space. I think so. I haven't read it. I haven't even looked up any details on it. I kind of want to read it now, just because. I mean, it just seems really cool. But don't cancel me because I because you know <laughs> H.P. Lovecraft was an anti-Semite or a racist. Yeah, I'm trying to find out how long it is. There's a. It seems like it's been adapted many many times. Uh, the film, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, short story. Published December or September nineteen twenty seven, and you can probably find it for free if you know, if you know where to look. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, what, what did you think about the end though, with the main character, quote unquote, Ward? Like, with the, in the flashback, did you like that? Like, he's like smoking a joint or a rolled cigarette or something, and like the water. One of those jazz cigarettes. Because we haven't talked about the there's, there's a whole like mayor aspect too, which we haven't talked yeah, about. Yeah, there's like the whole mayor news crew thing. What's happening with that? Uh, can you? Because that's pretty decently important, but it's also so far in the background that it it almost doesn't matter. I mean, it should be like national news, right? Well. We talked about like what a different movie would do. This th- a different movie would be like a big conspiracy where the mayor's trying to get him off this land. You know what I mean? It would be more of like a thing. You'd be wondering like, is this the mayor doing this to the kids? Like you'd mentioned Scooby Doo. It'd be a very like, it was the mayor the whole time. Type I would have gotten which, away with it too. <laughs> so like the the whole like scene at the end. It, it it's starting to touch on like some weird like environment not weird but like environmentalism themes you know what mm-hmm. I mean like it, which doesn't doesn't really fit in uh, I keep getting that like movie uh, with Jesse Eisenberg like as a suggestion from this have you seen that I forget what it's called the one where he like blows up the dam or whatever he has a movie where he blows up a dam Berg blows up dam give me like two seconds <laughs> 
not Jesse Heisenberg. Uh, I'll find it in two seconds. But like, it, like it, it's a very like weird environmentalism tie-in, is it not? Because presumably now everyone's drinking the alien. That's what we're supposed to think. Yeah, everybody's full like full blown alien at this point. But like, you touch on environmentalism. Like, what are the actual themes of this movie? No idea. Like I said, it, it kind of has like this quasi. It brings out the worst and everybody. Night moves, by the way. Name of the Jesse Eisenberg movie. Really good movie where he like, has like this weird environmentalism terrorist guy and things go wrong. It's kind called of like Night Moves. It's called Night Moves. It's kind of like Blue Ruin, uh, it, like in the sense that like the main character is like really fucking stupid and like you're just watching him make all these mistakes <laughs> over and over and over again and it's kind of like frustrating from that perspective. But I don't. I mean, I don't know. It's it's. Like I said, the, the dad's kind of uh, like kick the dog type dad. He's frustrated with his life. He takes it off on out on his kids and wife and stuff. The mom. His and the fruit's son. gone bad, Pap. The, the the harvest has gone bad. <laughs> that scene is ridiculous. Where he's just biting everything. Just and, like, biting screaming. and throwing it. Loved it. So that, like that, like the mom and son are codependent. Like don't be lazy and smoke weed. Like don't be into witchcraft i don't know are there themes to this are, movie? are there themes is, i mean is there even an argument in this movie like, is there a central dramatic argument i don't think so i think it's just kind of a ghost a ghost story right it's, like, yeah, it's, it's a, just kind of a happening right yeah a sci-fi tale don't get me wrong listener audience i love a happening movie uh but i'm just trying to break this down like what are the themes of this movie what a so I don't know about themes. I got to be honest. But what did you think about the comp- obviously the comparisons to Mandy with the same same producers, including Elijah Wood, who we mentioned, same star, Nick Cage, and same color palette. I would argue very much like drenched in purple, dark blue mm-hmm. type stuff. Like so, you watch the trailer for this. You've just seen Mandy a year ago. You're gonna think Mandy. The the trailer says from the producers. From the of producers Mandy, of yeah. It's a very different movie, though, wouldn't you say? Isn't not... I mean, isn't from the producers of one of the greatest lies ever told? It doesn't mean anything. It, to it's me. meaningless. It's just yeah. attaching. It's just literally just tying up one movie to another, being like, "Yeah, they." Were, I mean, they produced this one too. It's one of the greatest lies ever told. But yeah, this is uh, nothing like Mandy at all. I mean. Na- Mandy, I mean, for what it was, was a revenge fairy tale, right? I mean, there was orcs mm-hmm. in Mandy. And Mandy is glacial. And this is very much like trying to fit in almost too much. Not almost too much for an hour and 50 minutes compared. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, I always hate to say this, but this movie kind of felt its length, didn't it? Yeah, like, it did. It, 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 in, at parts, you're kind of like... Like I always, I always pause at the forty-six minute mark, uh, and I was shocked by how long it felt like it took to get there. Like, mm-hmm. wow, we're <laughs> not even halfway through, and I feel like it's taking a long time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's just very disorienting in like structure and style, right? There's no, like you said, there's no real main character. There's no sense of even like day or night or how long the story is taking place. Like, I think. I think that might be what it's going for. It's disorientation, but like that's never, never a positive when a movie feels this length. Kind of going back to Ward, did he really need to be in the beginning of this movie? Did he need to be in the end? Did he need to be in the end? Like what? What? What purpose was there for him to be there? What did you think about him in the end, though? Did you say that? Yeah. Like, what did you think about that final <sighs> shot? Could have done without. It's. It could have ended like when you said earlier. It could have ended with the explosion. It could have, could ended. have ended with the explosion. It's all. I mean, it's all it needed to be. I mean, that was just a happening. If you're going to make a happening movie, don't try to, you know, tie it up at the end with an extension scene. I don't need to see that. I didn't know he was supposed to be that important until I saw him at the end of the movie. It's like, oh, this is the main character. I guess the only thing I can think of is the original treatment of this story had Ward as the main character. More involved. And kind of like this family was kind of like a sideshow. I could see that. And I think when the producers of Mandy caught on, they flipped it. Where Ward was a sideshow and the family is our main focus now. 
Yeah, I would have. I, I the thing of it is, if you take out Ward from this movie, even if you take out the whole mare and like water reservoir subplot. <laughs> This movie doesn't get any worse. You know what I mean? I'm if not you saying, take out Ward, it does, it's no different either. It would be very... It would almost be more self-contained and, like I said, more claustrophobic, more... They could... They had, obviously, I had no way of knowing this, but, like, more relevant to us now in the quarantine. That's, like, just this family with a mom working from home and everyone's, like, on each other's last nerve. Like, it's kind of a bummer to me. We... The movie pivots to Ward's point of view, um... Right when the shit's really hitting the fan, like when he goes it, to check on... It's a hard pivot, too. Very hard pivot. He goes to check on Tommy Chong again. again. Again, he's the only bridge we have between the family and Tommy Chong. They're basically, like, in parallel dimensions for, for all we care. But, like, we don't even see how Lavinia goes down. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, you're right. It's just... She's just glowing at that point. She's with Nick Cage, and then she's, like, a, at the end, she's a ghost on the couch. And it's like... She's at least the second main character in this movie. We spent at least a second, maybe the most time with her. See, I out thought of Lavinia was going to be the main for a long time. We spent a lot of time with her. Stevie, question: What do you think happened to her? <sighs> I couldn't even begin to answer that, Pat. <laughs> 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 this movie, as I said, there are no rules. Yeah. I mean, for all I know, uh, she leads the color revolution. For, yeah, uh, I was going to say she went willingly, for all yeah, I know. Yeah, she went willingly. She led the color revolution at the very end, for all I know. Um, but yeah, I thought Lavinia was going to be our main focus. It just, I mean, this movie, I mean, I don't mind that it does. It just plays a lot of, like, pa- you know, pass the torch. Like, mm-hmm. you take it, no, you take it, no, you take it, no, you take it. It's just, I don't know, it's really disorienting. <laughs> In a good way. Like, the cast holds the up. The cast is good. There are, I, I didn't think there were any weak links as far as acting goes. I don't see a, but, let's see, estimated budget $6 million and it made, that can't be right. Okay, six yeah, $6 million budget, it hasn't made its money back in theaters necessarily maybe it's gonna do it on vod but for a low budget like this to have this solid of a cast like yeah that was i mean that was nice to see i feel like everybody pulled their weight um and the nice thing was too there were no annoying characters there's nothing exactly. worse than you know kind of a horror sci-fi movie that has the annoying character mm-hmm. it's very tropey that didn't have this it was nice it's uh underrated i would say yeah. Well, um, last thing I'll add. Okay. Uh, the fu- the fusion of the mother and the bo- and the and the son <laughs> when that mom is crawling around freaked me out. It was terrifying. Like when, when she's did, like getting good at walking and stuff. Yeah. When they did that above shot and you see her move across the room, uh, I didn't like that. Yeah, I think it. <sighs> I think like uh, an actual like noise came out of me that I didn't like this. <laughs> it was scary. Plus, the way she was say- saying Lavinia was also really freaky too. Lavinia. Yeah. Yeah. See, just <laughs> yeah. Put that in the hijack. But um, <laughs> you ready for yes or no's? Oh yeah. All right. Uh, go ahead, Pep. All right. I'm gonna give this a very solid. Yes. Uh, it's one of those things where this is like, if you look on IMDb, it says 2019. I had no way of seeing this in 2019. So for me, it's a 2020 movie. And by that standard, it's probably my favorite movie I've seen in 2020. Let's go. I was pretty surprised by like the people who I really trust on Letterboxd didn't seem to like this movie as much as I did. Uh, maybe it's the fact that like we haven't had like as good of art house A24 content but i really really love this movie i love the colors i love the way it looked like i said nick cage's accent i could very easily see like you know <laughs> leaving a theater and hearing like five people be like that was fucking bullshit like he was all over the place he couldn't even say a character. <laughs> but like i think it's it's clearly a very intentional choice it's a really cool way to see him like a character like losing it and this like, nick cage being nick cage at his best it's no Mandy. Like, don't get me wrong. And, like, to even compare it to Mandy, I, I don't think that the marketing was doing it any credit. I would just let Nick Cage 
speak for himself and, and you don't need to couch it in from the producers of Mandy. Yeah. But from what I saw, I loved it. I do kind of want to read this short story now. Um, and yeah, Hard Yes for Me, probably my favorite movie of 2020, if it's a 2020 movie. I consider it 2020. Uh, yeah, I will give this a hard yes. The way I can describe this to somebody, um, this movie is for, like, legitimate movie lovers. Right, Pap? 100%. Like, this isn't, like, your casual, uh, you know, kind of, you know, I see, I watch a movie a month type person. This is for somebody who really enjoys cinema. And the way it just looks, it almost looks like... This movie is at a drive-in theater inside another movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, this movie's being shown at a drive-in in another movie. And I loved it. The colors, I mean, my God, the colors were so cool. Cinematography's awesome. Uh, I like the way the cast played with each other. I didn't mind that the, the script, I mean, I didn't mind the story had no rules. That was almost the fun part of it. Um, it does feel its length every now and then, but if you love movies and you love Nick Cage and you love visuals in movies as much as I do. Watch this movie. It is fantastic. So, hard yes for me. Something different. So, yeah, it, it, maybe that's one reason like why I responded to it the way I did and say, hey, Pap, watch this movie. is because it is something different, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, do, I don't know. Like, I, I think I would have liked to see it on theaters. But like, it's just, I'm so desperate, Stevie, for anything new. I'm so desperate for Stevie Pappy episodes to talk about something like, there's no A24, we're missing out on all of that. No French dis Dispatch, no Tenet, no... What's that uh, movie that A24 is doing? The Green, um, is it The Green King? Green King, I think. Oh, that, I'm looking forward to that so much. Someday. But <laughs> what our audience has to look forward to is you and I, I haven't told you this yet, we're going to be on the Cine Study podcast doing our top 10 movies of the 90s. Oh, my so God. So check that out. But also coming down the feed, we have Never Ending Story. Uh, we just put out uh, The Fifth Element. Look for Office Space to come out. A lot of uh, more 90s content, more 80s, 90s content coming down the pipeline. Uh, anything else I'm missing? Um... <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that top 10 of the 90s, man. Yeah, it's not top 5. It's going to be top 10. It's going to be top, you top 10? Five. You told top me top ten. 5. Top 10 favorite of the 90s. Not, not best. ones you think that are best, but your yeah, top that's 10 a bullshit. favorite. Yeah, d top 10 best lists are bullshit because it's like... They're your favorites you anyway. To, who are you to say? Yeah, what's best? Like, yeah, just do your favorites. So it's going to be our favorites of the 90s. I bet, you can, I bet you, you can already guess three of mine. Oh, I know I can. I bet you can guess my number one, if you think. Don't say it. <sighs> All right, I won't say it, but I, I bet you you could... I bet you... I, I mean, I'll just say them. Heat, Point Break, and uh, Bowfinger. Those will be in the top ten. I'll say this. Muppet Christmas Carol <laughs> will make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> what about Treasure Island? You'll have to tune in. Subscribe to Cine Study, but and get and please give the podcast you listen to not just ours uh, five stars. Support them, but especially the small podcast. It's a tough time to be a podcast out there right now, so show them some love. Yeah. Also, um, I know I always say this, but uh, if you guys have like weird movies or off the beaten path movies that you want me and Pat to spoil, or just your normal random Joe movies that everyone has seen a thousand times. You know, hit us up on Instagram, hit us up on Twitter, even do it through the iTunes feed. Like, we just love spoiling movies, so please, we will spoil anything. I think we're going to do a fan request here in a month or so where we do in uh, Place Beyond the Pines. Place Beyond the Pines, we got a Slither request as well. We're trying to be better about the request, so if, if you do it, especially if you want like a mini episode, uh, that's going to be a lot easier for, uh, for us to do. So just let us know what you want us to do, and we'll try and make it happen. Also, I am totally in favor of going to total request spoilers. So, please, people, start sending in your requests. TRS. TRS, total request spoilers. But uh, I just want to say thank you guys for listening. Our fans are awesome. Pap, do you have fun? I had a lot of fun. Great recommendation, as always. I don't know how you do it. Please find, a, find the right movie. I watch a movie a day, Pap, so I have to find something new. But, uh, yeah. As always, that was Spoilers.
They are alpacas. Alpacas. 